Uh, my name is Trevor Tomish. Uh, I am originally from Wisconsin in the United States. Um, obviously, I'm not English. Um, but I'm doing my PhD in computing at the University of Worcester. Uh, my director of studies is Dr. Colin B. Price. Um, anyhow, this is uh, tangentially related to my PhD, which I'll probably submit next year to do a talk about the Blender conference, which I'm also doing in Blender. Um, currently, I am researching uh, how we can improve computing, computer science, ICT in Britain. Um, hence the title of my presentation, Teaching Programming with Python and the Blender Game Engine. So, moving on. So, Ever the Optimists, uh, this is a actual publication published by the Royal Society. Shut down or restart the way forward for computing in UK schools. Uh, it's actually a rather large publication, but basically it says all sorts of positive words like this. Uh, dwindling enthusiasm, short of specialist teachers, highly unsatisfactory, boring, lack of continuing professional development for teachers. This is all like computing and ICT in the 21st century, where everyone has a Turing complete device in their pocket. So this is obviously unacceptable. <clears throat> to uh, further substantiate this claim that teaching needs help, we can look here. Uh, this is GCSE entry, so we're talking, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about college students here, um, about 16 years old. Am I right? Yeah. OK, great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I have an educator for you. OK, so we can uh, look here. We can see all of the information technology this is a uh, total number of entries, so this is enrollment rather than retention. Uh, we can see that it starts out nice and high in 2001 and then just keeps dropping as we go into the 20 teens. So obviously this is not a good outlook and we need to do something to change this. Uh, furthermore, you could maybe argue, oh well, that's just because uh, enrollment's dropping in, G or in GCSE level. Uh, topics in Great Britain. Well, that's not the case. I mean, if you look here, mathematics is in red. The enrollment has gone up in recent years. So obviously, it's not the math, it's not the STEM fields that are hurting. Um, mostly an upward trend, but let's look at ICT. ICT is, once again, going down. Computing, down. Levels are way down. Uh, and there's been a lot of different ideas as to how we might improve this. Uh, most of it centers around how we can teach programming. And so that's my major concern, is how we can better teach programming. So, this was from the Royal Society. Uh, their suggestion, one of their suggestions, they published a whole bunch of suggestions, but one of their suggestions as to how to improve education, computing education in Britain, is to allocate technology for teachers, including people-friendly programming environments. Now, before I go on, can somebody uh, off the top of their head kind of give me an idea of what you think a pupil-friendly programming environment might be? Any specific names that come to mind? Endless. Yeah. Endless. What's that? Endless. Endless. Oh, Alice. 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 Yeah. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. My accent's horrible. <laughs> so, Alice. Yeah. Okay. Alice. Yeah. yeah Alice. Um, the one I hear constantly. Scratch. 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 It's all teachers are talking about right now. Is scratch. Well, let's take a look. Processing. Processing. Yeah, it's actually up there. <laughs> so, so scratch. Alice. Greenfoot. Logo. Processing. You've heard of logo probably. Um, Alice. Once again, Alice is actually built on Python. Um, Greenfoot, uh, I don't know much about Greenfoot, Scratch, drag and drop environment, processing, I've used, and I like processing, I'll talk about it a little bit, but uh, they want visual context. Everything needs to be in our society in, our, in 2012. Everything needs to be visual, it needs to be immediate, it needs to be responsive. Uh, gone are the days when we can just sit down and say, uh, all right, print, hello world, students are interested. I mean, that's probably the most, the, the most boring exercise that we can come up with as educators. You know, students are going to be like, oh, well, I can, I can write hello world. What's this computer so impressive? Why is this computer so impressive? 
I mean, I learned how to program. I was taught by physicists, so you can imagine what my programming style is. I was taught by physicists, uh, and that's the first thing we did. Hello world, then we went right on to number crunching. But that's how it's traditionally taught, and that's how we're still teaching it. And it does not resonate with our uh, interactive, cyber-aware youth. I hate to use this term, but digital natives. We need something. And here's what they propose. For example, Scratch. Now, I look at Scratch and it makes me sad. Huh. Uh, this is not programming, in my opinion. This is not programming. This is a very specialized environment to kind of get students kind of get students uh, thinking about programming, thinking about concepts like for loops, and loops, while loops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's drag and drop. It looks like Legos or something, you know? And when we're dealing with GCSE students, I mean, these are kids that are like between 14 years and 18 years, somewhere in there. Uh, this is not appropriate, but this is what's being taught. This kind of stuff. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you sell yourself? Oh, yeah, I, I, when you try to go to the, seek employment, oh, yeah, you know, I drag and drop some bricks and made a happy face. Dance around, whatnot. No, this is, this is not what we want to teach our students. Is this targeted at people from 14 years up? I don't think No, so. this is not targeted, no. but it's being used is a problem. Um, the teachers that I've interviewed and talked to, um, they've, they've been using stuff like this with their students. Um, it might be a good way to introduce really much younger kids, but it's, it's, not, it's not a solution. Uh, one of the solutions that I like, personally, is processing. Um, now, processing, this is actually uh, from my website. Um, processing is based uh, kind of on Java. The syntax is pretty much Java. Um, and it's immediate, it's visual, but one of the major problems that teachers complain about is the code overhead, the setup involved. I mean, it's easy enough for somebody who's been programming um, for a little while, but uh, immediately you wind up with um, having to import different libraries, uh, set up void, um, different kinds of, different kinds of uh, objects, different object types. Uh, there's a bit of code overhead. That, and the most important thing is that this is not marketable. There may be in web development, some, some companies are starting to use processing and whatnot, because it's a really easy way to do really interactive, fun JavaScript. But uh, it's not particularly marketable for people who want to eventually go into some sort of <laughs> computing field, some sort of uh, field where they will be heavily using programming and whatnot. So reflecting on that, these are quotes from a couple different papers. Market appeal, industry demand, and student demand is one of the most important factors affecting language choice in computer science education. Okay. Such specialized teaching environments leave students without a real world, world programming language upon graduation. And that's talking about these guys, the ones that teachers have been using traditionally. Not traditionally, but the teachers are using now. Uh, here's the TOB index, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, supports that claim. So you got C up here. And of course, C is 20% plus of the uh, rating, Java, Python, Python's, Python's number eight. Um, and then logo extraction processing and Alice are way down there, they don't even make the top 10. Um, for obvious reasons, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to uh, program a space shuttle uh, balance system or whatnot in logo. <clears throat> I'd be interested to see if you could program industrial strength programs in logo. But I, I, I don't know. Uh, and here's a, a overview of um, one second. It's not so much different. Excuse me. It's not so much different. Which is in, so industrial programming software from Logo. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, no, it's it's the big mistake of, of people that are not involved in these industries. Is that if if you do spaceship things or if you do something for a factory it's 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 magic it has to be different and uh, mm. I am and I have been involved in software for the railways industry and it, it has never ceased to amaze me that a company like Siemens that does in-house development of software for telephones mm. they themselves don't know what their own departments 
across the own company have in varieties of software. And essentially, it, it's, it's lack of looking what the neighbors do. Lack of communication departmentally. It's, it, and essentially, most of the programming languages share most of the things in common. Mm -hmm. Syntax and whatnot. Yeah, that's an important thing. But the, the students, one of their major complaints is that they're not learning anything that's going to be used. That's, that's one of the major complaints. That's why we're getting bad ratings. And if you work in the UK, one of the things that you come to realize is that if the students aren't happy, you get bad ratings. If you get bad ratings, your school gets reprimanded. That's a problem. But speaking of, uh, at Worcester, we have uh, we, we held a symposium uh, funded by a Google grant. Um, and we took a bunch of school teachers in. They were all ICT school teachers, because now uh, in the UK, we're switching from ICT to computing, proper computing. Um, well, at least that's the hope. Uh, so we asked them what programming languages uh, they currently taught. So this was worrying to me. By far, you had the teachers teaching Scratch. Uh, next was VB, Pascal, HTML, Kodu, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Python had uh, one person was talking about teaching Python. This was a questionnaire before they came in. So we, we distributed this before they came in to our session. Now, what they said that they planned on teaching once they uh, moved to computing rather than ICT. Python, obviously, uh, takes a hit here. You have Python at nine responses. Um, a couple people weren't sure, but then it just goes down from there. So there is a demand for Python. There is demand for teaching and learning Python um, in schools. Uh, for various reasons, for the fact that it's very versatile, for the reason that uh, it's being used in all sorts of different sectors. Um, it's a very, what they cite, it's an easy language. I would argue that it's not an easy language, but I mean, that's subjective. <coughs> But uh, this, is, this is a bunch of their responses. It's an excellent language for teaching. Uh, straightforward, simple syntax. Um, it's preferred by the staff that they have coming in to help with their new computing curriculum. Um, simple support and ease of functionality. So the question is, how do we implement Python? Because uh, Python is not inherently visual. I mean, it's still just a text-based uh, programming language. So, how do we add this visual context to Python? So, Pygame. Pygame is one of my favorite things on Earth. Um, I love to program little programs and little games in Pygame. There's a lot of very good books out there for Pygame. Um, I actually, I, I absolutely love it. But uh, here's a kind of a standard Pygame sort of uh, script here. Um, I'll just let that sink in for you guys. All right, I think it's not good enough. Okay, and now let's execute it and run it. That's what you get. <laughs> yeah, no, that's how you set up a blank window in Pygame. It's a lot of code overhead. Uh, you know, and students, once again, they're going to get frustrated with that. Uh, one of the things that they do complain about is, you know, why do we need this? Why, why isn't this simpler? Um, the code overhead is very important, especially for students and these teachers that are just learning programming for the first time themselves. So what are other alternatives? OpenGL, anybody who's used OpenGL knows that it's, it's good. It's good, but it's not exactly uh, intuitive for learners. Um, I mean, any other ideas out there what you could use for visualization? Smalltalk. What's that? Smalltalk. Ah, small, small talk? Yeah, because they have a new implementation, and I think it's called Pix. Okay, but for in Blender, though. Or, I mean, in, in Python, though. <coughs> yeah, or we'll get a Python. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, you say WX, but that's just programming GUIs. And there's, once again, Open Frameworks. Open Frameworks, um, which is, but, uh, once again, uh, it's, it's like processing, yeah. Oh, actually, it is processing. It's just implemented in C, right? Cinder. Cinder. Cinder, I've never. Yeah. Open yeah. Frameworks, like. Is there a Python implementation for it? It's actually a branch uh, as far as I know. Oh, open frameworks. Uh, right. So I'm mean, trying to stick with Python here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, naturally, I would say, let's use the Blender game engine. Um, 
It's a Blender conference, obviously. Uh, <laughs> so let's use the, let's try using the Blender game engine. Um, over the last year, I've been working exclusively, pretty much in Blender um, myself, uh, and I've come to realize how simple it can be to do some very basic visual things. It's got minimal code overhead, uh, graphical immediate feedback, full Python API, so you're not compromising the language at all. With like Alice, Alice is based on Python. But it compromises the language in such a way that you really don't get a feel of what the language is about. You're losing the finer points of the language. Uh, professional applications, obviously, there's call for it in web development, there's call for it uh, in science, um, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> it's multi platform, obviously. Uh, it's great for all skill levels, um, which is a really big issue, a really, really big issue with students is you'll have students that are over here, way off in the distance, uh, above and beyond the rest of their classmates, and then you'll have the students that are down here and don't know how to turn on a PC. So we need to find a way to entertain both those students. So Blender, the Blender game engine, you can do very basic things in it and keep these guys happy. And of course, as all of you know, there's a lot of features in Blender that they can play with to help them learn Python. Um, free and open, and obviously you guys got community support. So let's take a look at maybe a prototype. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a prototype sort of environment um, that I think would be good uh, <coughs> for students. So what I've done is I wrote a little bit of a script to kind of hide some of the code overhead. So you don't even see the calls to um, you know, import uh, BGE, et cetera, et cetera, um, own uh, equals whatever. Uh, now we have just import setup which is easy enough, I think, for students to understand. Um, cube equals setup.cube, if cube, blah, blah, blah. So what we want to do here, this is an exercise that I did with teachers. Um, what we want to do here is we want to get this cube to move in a square. That's the problem that they have to solve. Uh, you've got a very, very simple environment set up here. Um, they can control the cube. Um, and that's, that's very simple, very, very simple. Um, just moving a cube around, but it's visual, and it's immediate, it's feedback. Right, and a teacher can set up, you know, an interesting scene. You could have, instead of a cube there, you could have a car, or whatever, whatever you want to use as an object. Um, and down here, uh, in the uh, actual logic bricks, all you have is an always. All you have is an always actuator hooked up, and I don't have it hooked up right now because uh, apparently it's broken, but um, you have an always just hooked up to the cube, and all the other overhead's hidden. So, students would, be able to respond to this um, from all levels. Uh, they could, maybe if they're more mathematically inclined, try to get it to move in a sine wave, uh, move in circles. Actually, I had a problem with the teachers. Um, not that they didn't get the code, but I also tried to get them to have this little box oscillate back and forth. Um, and then I had, to, I had to teach them what a sine function was, and that was a little different, because that's not where I expected, that's not where I expected problems to arise. But it was a good teaching moment, at least for me. But the idea is to be able to take Blender and use it just, just besides what we, what we usually think of Blender as, what we usually think of as a game engine as, uh, use it for education, um, programming education. So, moving back to my PowerPoint. I'm a Linux guy, so I'm kind of uh, lost when it comes to that. Show the example. So, I want to get this started. I want to do this. I want to take Blender and put it out there, talk to school kids, talk to teachers, organize outreaches. I want to use Blender and Python as an environment to teach because obviously we need, we need teachers to have the tools to teach students programming. 
but we need those tools to be free and available and accessible, and we need a community behind them. So I guess this is kind of my sales pitch here. Um, if you're interested in this idea, uh, I would love for you to contact me, maybe give me some more ideas. Um, we're going to continue with this locally, but uh, I'd like to see it move on. I'd like to see Blender be used <coughs> in IT and uh, ICT and uh, computing classrooms all across England and all across uh, Europe and all across the world. So, if you got any questions, feel free to ask. Yes? I'm, I'm doing a couple of projects at the moment with my students with Blender and Python, mm -hmm. but I'm finding it really, really difficult to find anything out there in terms of uh, exactly what you're talking about. Are, are there any websites out there for teaching that program? I've never been able to find any publications, and that's, that's uh, one of the things that I'd really like to get into motion. I didn't put it up there, but I'd really like to put some publications into motion. I haven't seen any either. Um, so uh, I guess my answer is no. <laughs> Short answer. Yes. Did you look at Arduino? Arduino, yes. Uh, we've actually used it um, you know, with, with, the, with the teachers. Arduino uh, is really good, especially you can interface it with um, Yeah, it, it makes you move something in the real world. Uh, yeah, yeah, that could be definitely an extension. An extension of this project. And it's really simple. I, yeah, exactly. No, I have used I have used Arduino with Blender, um, not in teaching, but I've used it uh, for um, just as a prototype. And I think I'll probably introduce it in, uh, into the teaching context at some point. Any other questions, comments, ridicule? Comments? Yes. Have you seen uh, Roran Milanovic's uh, YouTube channel? Uh, Oh, no. No. He has a whole series about how to use the game engine with starting just the game engine and then continuing on to scripting with Python basics, mm. forwards, and a whole course about, yeah, in 40 hours, how to explain, how to work the whole thing through. Okay. So, uh, well, what I would like to see, and that'd be a good starting point, what I would like to see is uh, not just teaching Blender, but teaching Python through Blender. That would be what's, what's important to me. Um, I mean, of course, I want people to learn Blender because, what, hey, Blender's awesome. But I'd really like to see people uh, teach um, Python through Blender rather than just teaching Blender. Yeah, you yeah, no, no, uh, just saying that uh, uh, actually, to me, it was the other way around. I uh, started using Blender because of the incredibly easy API that it has. Um, so I started right away programming, then I became interested in other things. So to me, coming from uh, open frameworks, processing this environment, uh, I've been amazed at how it easy it is when you know you follow some, uh, you read some code of other people. And yeah. It's well, not yeah, that's difficult to talk. That's one of the beautiful things um, in a, about this uh, software. Uh, I'm going to open it up here again. I didn't go over the. Uh, I didn't go over the uh, demonstration very thoroughly. Oh, you know why? It's two point six. That's probably <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is extremely simple. Uh, are you next? What? No, no, no. no. Oh. This isn't. Read the. Oh, you can't read. The uh, yeah, this is extremely simple. Um, and I've, I've hidden, I've hidden the calls, um, you know, uh, associating the cube with the code and whatnot. So you've got the um, BGE dot, uh, can't remember that routine, uh, where you <coughs> define own. Usually, it's defined. Actually, if I went into the uh, templates, you open this I have, yeah, I have most of the temp. I have most of the game logic. Here we go. <coughs> this, these, these calls right here, I have them hidden in just another Python file. Um, the students never see it because it's really uh, we don't need to explain um, in depth what yeah. these mean to the students. That will that's the code overhead that I'm talking about with with the other languages. So I make sure to hide those, um, and I think it's really important that right now that doesn't distract them from the more important points um, when it comes to learning the language, learning how to program. Um, but yeah, I mean, how can it be more simple? I mean, you import setup. And then say cube is equal to subcube. Students really they can look at that and kind of think, okay, 
fine, I understand, I don't really even need to know that, but the important part is right here. All this, this is, this is uh, I was teaching if statements. Um, this is the important uh, pithy stuff that they need, um, and that's an easy way to deliver it. I mean, seriously, it's just cube.position.y equals cube.position.y plus 0.1, and that moves cube up 0.1. That's so simple. Um, and of course, you put this on a loop, and it uh, moves around in a square. And they have to, um, they have to use, uh, rely on their own logic, their own problem-solving skills in order to do this. It's kind of funny when you see them get to the end of the program, and the first thing they do is they have, uh, they have this if statement here, the first if statement. They have it without the and statement because they don't think, oh, um, what happens, what happens when you have y is less than zero and you have x is less than ten, right? Or equal to zero. Y is equal to zero. And you have x is less than ten. Uh, they don't think about that right away. They get to the end and say, "Oh crap! It stopped. What's going on?" Um, and they eventually solved it. But uh, yeah.